I wanted to talk about where we were, we were, we were hiking. We were out at, at uh, where did we go? The old MASH site nearby outside LA, yeah. whatever that's called, Malibu Canyon Trail. And one of the things we were talking about was the, what was the, the lead female actor's name in Gone in the Wind? Was it Anne Lee? Ooh, gone with I don't know. Ann Lee. I should know this. I majored in film. Max, we need we need you. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so the so the so the the uh, leading actress, her name I'm pretty sure is Ann Lee. That's spelled like L E I G H. She died of tuberculosis when mm-hmm. she was 53. No big deal. Um, and one of the things we were talking about with that was her. This is a complete. One tangent going uh, out of how you felt with that. Um, what is your name, Max? Vivian Lee. Vivian Lee. Vivian, Vivian, Lee. Lee. Vivian Lee. By the way, for listeners, our producer's name is also Max. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We've got to yeah, come up with a exactly, nickname yeah, for him. Exactly. Tweet me. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Tweet me. Tweet me your suggested nickname for right. our producer. So Max. complete 180, just to get off of sensations with with, with books, because um, I had an agenda of wanting to talk about this Vivian Lee character um, when she was being. Uh, born when she was in her mother in the womb, uh, the father, her father, would intentionally. You remember this, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So her father apparently would intentionally take the mother to all of these various different beautiful destinations, and the intention was she essentially wanted to mold Vivian Lee uh, through the eyes of her mother. Wow, this is pretty interesting. Super interesting. And that- so. I wonder how that because we were the, when we were walking, we're like, we're going to talk about that. How did that? How did that hit you? The idea that you could actually mold a child through the eyes of the mother and the experiences of the mother. Very uh, super interesting, beautiful concept. Um, I mean, I feel like I when you know when I hear things like that, I start to think about like the like. The mechanisms, you know, like the the scientific like mechanisms by which that might actually do something to the fetus. But I feel like you think about something like that on a more like philosophical. Well, like just l- both in general, all yeah. of it. You know, there's there's so much. I mean, there's a lot to it. There's all sorts of. You've heard of the different research around um, rats being able to uh, detect or be able to to have the memory of their. Uh, rat parents who went through like shock therapy essentially well they would expose these rats to this chemical smell uh this very odorous smell like very obvious like oh there's that that chemical uh and then they would shock the rats and then uh what they found with the the offspring of those rats when they would expose them to that smell they would end up having this cortisol response and kind of go into this fear contraction, like, oh, shit, there's a shock coming. Wow, like an inherited fear. Uh-huh. And so it's an interesting thing of thinking, like, like I've been thinking about this recently, of uh, what is the separation between us and our parents and our grandparents and, you know, on, onward all the way back through the, through the, the yeah. hierarchy? Um, I think it's way less than what we would suspect. Like, I don't know that there's a clear distinction between my mother, my father, me, and then I don't think there's a clear distinction between my parents and their grandparents. Thus, there's no clear distinction between me and my grandparents, and there's no clear distinction between me and anything, really. Yeah. It's super interesting. Like, if you can inherit fear, why couldn't you inherit, like, an appreciation for aesthetic, you know, um, what's the word? Uh... I'm just totally blanking on the word, but like, yeah, symmetry, like an aesthetic, like, you know, inherent an aesthetic appreciation. Yeah. And the, and the mother, as she's going through, um, it's a really big deal that a, a, a mother is experiencing, she's essentially feeding the child in the womb, hmm. the various different chemicals and neurochemistry and all the hormones and such that would be released in her body through her. Yeah experience in life she's saturating that child that's pouring right into that child and that child's experiencing life as the mother does you know so if they go through something that's incredibly stressful um you know there's been all sorts of instances of this with like war times and there was like the dutch hunger winters that affected babies metabolisms um they but with this the stress specifically uh, children that will be um, saturated in that that stress 
while they're in the womb, um, they'll end up creating somewhat of like a, a tolerance to to cortisol, to wow. stress hormones. And so then they come out and they have this this higher threshold for it. So thus their body needs to produce more of it. Wow. You know, and so it's uh, it's kind of like a like an insulin resistance, but with stress. It's amazing. Well, we know that we know that like <clears throat> the environment can cause epigenetic changes that then get passed on yeah. to our offspring, and we know that um, that experiencing. I mean, we were talking about this too on the hike. The you know Andrew Huberman, PhD, who's done some research in his lab, suggesting that just broadening out your gaze to a peripheral, mm-hmm. you know, uh, sort of panoramic gaze. Yeah can actually reduce the stress response in the body, reduce, you know, cortisol, things like that. We know how amazing, you know, being out in nature is for your body on a biochemical level. Yeah. So, I mean, I have no doubt that that would actually have like a, it sounds like that would would have a pretty meaningful impact. If that's what you're doing routinely, you know, you're like, you're, if you're pregnant, you're going out, spending more time outdoors. Yeah. So think of that. So, so that's, I have a whole chapter in the, in the book that was all reviewed from, Huberman. Huberman's a, a close buddy, um, and he was gracious enough to go through and essentially like edit all my mistakes. Hmm. So thank you to, to Lord <laughs> Lord Huberman. Um, but in that, you know, thinking of that, Vivian Lee, uh, her mother going out in the world, uh, apply that next layer of okay, our vision affects our hormones, affects our neurochemistry, affects our levels of stress. Uh, if she's out in the mountains, hiking through the prairies and looking up at the clouds and kind of taking it all in, that's literally tuning her nervous system to calm the freak down, you know, as opposed to maybe a mother that is, you know, stressed out with work and is, you know, still chugging along with the computer and staring at screens and inside of this room underneath these art- artificially blue lit lights all day long and, you know, not able to get enough movement and walking and not get the circulation to be able to pump out all those old stress hormones, and all that stuff that's been produced from that environment. Yeah. And then they bring a child into that situation, um, you know, and it's like, it's, it's, it doesn't seem like a coincidence that uh, statistically there's so many people that are utilizing some type of pharmaceutical medication for anti-anxiety medication or antidepressants and all of that stuff in a, a structural mold that is inherently stressful. Hmm. You know, so from the drop, a child coming out into that system and then imagine being a baby and coming out into this sterile environment now probably even more sterile than ever before you know and the blue lights in your eyes and some doctor with these gloves and you know and then they don't actually spank you right what, what was that all about i don't know <laughs> what do they, i've always thought yeah when you come out they, they do that? i don't know i don't know enough i'm not a father how have you been managing? <laughs> how have you been managing your stress during during these times? Because the last time we got together to record this felt like forever ago. It was yeah. like it was a couple months before coronavirus, BLM, and I know that you're a really sensitive guy. So like, I'm a cancer. You're a cancer. What is that? What is that? Uh, I don't know. Huh. Um, the only thing that I know about astrology is that whenever I tell a female that I'm Gemini, I always get yeah. like a groan. Oh, yeah. Ge- Gemini's are apparently not high on the dating. There's probably a lot of people listening just nodding their head like, oh. <laughs> I don't know anything about astrology. I'm on, I have the, <laughs> I have the apps and I find them to be pretty funny, but then I, I always intentionally will go and read other star signs to, to just to validate my sense that it's all kind of BS, mm. but it's a pretty sweet move. If you learn about a girl's astrological sign, hmm. I've never done it, but I would imagine, yeah, you know, you come back and you have all the information. That's true. I did it with one girl. Yeah, she was a Leo. Huh. Yeah, her name's Tiffany. So you learned everything you could about the Leo. Leos. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I went deep on Leo. Wow. I literally only know about Leo and Cancer. Hmm. Oh. Well, I'm a Gemini. Oh, okay. Um, Maybe I should go deep on Gemini to impress you. It's the we're known for having for being like two faced or having. Uh, oh wow. Duplicitous. Being, being like. That's a nice word. I guess what would be relevant to like the relationship is that your Gemini's are thought to be like hot and cold. Like, you know, the Katy Perry song, like you're hot and you're cool. It's like bipolar. Yeah. Some, somewhat mm-hmm. that's like, which I don't think I am, but I mean, no, I don't know. No, you're a little bit of a, of a, what is that called? You're, you're, you're overcorrecting <laughs> our producer. You're, micromanaging. You're a little micromanager. Yeah. <laughs> I bet I can micromanage a little bit. I can micromanage. I don't know if that's necessarily a trait of the Gemini, but we need to get back to this Vivian, Vivian, and story. Yeah, was there more to the story? No, I don't think so. Um, but I, no, but I want to know how you've been able to manage your stress. 
during these times? Because I feel like that's I've something I've been doing that, all the things, all the things I talk about. Like uh, what? Like it's, that's, and that is an interesting thing. So like I, I have experienced many moments of, of um, my big thing is that I more regularly experience is more of like a general sensation of apathy of just like, I don't, I don't really give a fuck. Hmm. Like what's, what is the point of any of this? Why am I here? What are we doing? Um, you know, what's the point of like trying so hard for what, like, where are we going? You know, it's false summit after false summit after fa- false summit. It's like, what's, what's the point of continuing to like walk these summits? Not that I'm having any kind of like suicidal ideation or anything. That was something I experienced as like a teenager for a bit, which is interesting. Um, are you a nihilist? I, I, sometimes I'll like creep into the nihilistic waters and then I'll, you know, go play paddle tennis with some friends and, hmm. you know, feel all optimistic again. Hmm. Um, but the things that I find within that uh, is literally just coming back to, I think there's a few things. One, I think like stillness and silence and introspection and getting out of the way of the minutia of your thoughts is immensely valuable. Um, you know, so the, the a common tendency for me is to lean uh, on these various different crutches of sorts in the form of like doing healthy shit, you know, taking a walk, looking out into the distance, looking up into the clouds, doing exercise, um, you know, meditation. Well, meditation is, I think, one of those ones that I think is kind of like can go even go deeper, you know, like walking the stuff out is great because you're literally kind of walking that static energy out of your body. You're dancing it out or running it out or boxing it out or whatever it may be. Uh, But I think there's another layer of value to just sitting in stillness with your stuff, whatever it may be, uh, and kind of allowing it to almost like walk itself out in a way. Uh, You know, and so that's something that I've been finding immensely valuable is like essentially just doing both, exercising both sides of the spectrum, you know, so doing all the active things, um, getting together with community is like a lifesaver for me. The times that I do, I mean, I'll feel some degree of apathy almost every day. There'd be like at some point throughout the day where I'm just like, I don't think I give a shit. Okay, this is uncomfortable. Um, and then I will uh, call you or call a girl or call, you know, a friend or whatever and say, like, you want to go surfing? You want to go for a hike and just like, you know, whatever. Let's just do anything. And then I go out and whoa, like <laughs> everything changes. Um, you know, so for me, it's kind of this in and out. But I think there is a like a, a, a deeper realm of a stronger foundation of sorts uh, if you allow yourself to actually um, go through that static just in, in silence and actually sitting with it. You know, so meditation has become something that's been uh, more potent for me recently. Hmm. What do your workouts look like these days? Well, I trained before I came over here. Uh, a lot of kettlebell stuff and a lot of like gymnastic meets kettlebell meets calisthenics hmm. and then it's like acro yoga and then I, I I think it's really important for a person to be highly adaptable and so uh, I think there's there's baseline mechanical principles that a person ought to be able to, to sort out in their body so having basic fundamental mechanics of their hips you know understanding okay I need to be able to hinge my hips back and be able to create leverage from there be able to activate my glutes and be able to have that whole sequence of muscles fire in such a way that I'm going to be able to get that optimal power output out of my body, Um, you know, neutral spinal mechanics, being able to get my arms up over my head without just flaring my ribs. Um, And these are all principles that we we break down in the book. And that was kind of the intention of writing the book was to create a succinct user's manual on how to effectively inhabit your body, essentially. Hmm. So we don't get those basic principles in phys ed. Phys ed, you're like hucking balls at each other. And, you know, you got to remember your gym shorts, essentially, is like, you know, there's, I think we could go a bit deeper into the actual education part of, of, of physicality, you know, so those basic, uh, fundamentals, those baselines, I try to integrate most of those into each movement practice or workout. And then beyond that, I think it's super valuable to like play sports, you know, or like wrestle or, Hmm. you know, just be silly, you know, do anything that makes you uncomfortable, um, I think is a really great opportunity. I was thinking this in the relation to yesterday with my birthday. So I was like trying to think of something, you know, profound to write on an Instagram post or whatever, which sounds, sounds cheesy. <laughs> uh, you know, but that was, that was one of the things that came up was like, if something is in relationships, 
with yourself, with others, whatever it may be, the world. Um, if something is challenging to love, then it's probably an indication that there's work there for you. Hmm. You know, so it's like like the harder something is to love, it's like, well, there's, there's probably like lessons here. There's probably something. This is probably exactly where you need to be. You know, so it's a similar sensation from a movement perspective. If there's something like this just sucks. You know, when you go into those situations where your, your arms move funny and your hips aren't doing the right thing and all that stuff, your brain is going over time. So from a, a neuroplasticity level, you're like firing neurons way, way more than you would be if you were just honing in on some golf swing that you've already done 10,000 times. So from a neurological perspective, which, which you and your listeners are interested in, um, that's going to be some of the, uh, the best territories that you can exist in um, if one of your interests is uh, neurological development, is actually putting yourself in physical situations that are uh, demanding in the sense, from a perspective of like, I just don't know how to do this and I need to figure this out. Um, but most of us typically tend to occupy places that we already know and understand. Hmm. And you're kind of just going through the reps and, and honing in. My preference is to, with regularity, put myself in situations that I feel like a total buffoon. <laughs> when was it, so when was the last time you did that? Oh, man, dancing. Dancing? Yeah, I danced with a lady I mean, a couple of days ago on, uh, on PCH, Pacific Coast Highway. And all the cops were like pushing us off, pushing us away or whatever. So we went from like beach to beach to beach. And the cops came out like, you have to leave. Oh, because you weren't allowed to be on the beach, right? Yeah, 4th of July weekend huh. in Los Angeles. Yeah. Um, but I feel like you move like a dancer. You're telling me you don't, you don't normally dance? Well, there's a little bit of pressure of feeling like I'm like, that I move like a dancer. Huh. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I want to be able to like, you know, really do it. And so partner dance stuff. I've done like, I did like a bachata competition thing huh. where I like learn specific dance steps to a specific song with a specific partner. And in that I could pose as though I actually like know how to do some bachata. Um, but I don't actually know how to do the damn dance. Hmm. Um, you know, so that would be an instance where it's just like figuring out that choreography with another person. Uh, so you're, there's a lot of different levels to that, you know, so there's the intimacy with the person. Um, there's the, if there's music, you're, you're, um, attuning yourself to that music to be able to move on the beat. Um, and then there's also the coordination of my hands and my feet and my breathing pattern. You know, it's like this whole complex orchestra that when you do bring it together and you find that alignment with all of those variables, um, it's like a, you know, it's like a mental, mind, body, spirit, yeah, neuron, superfood. Everything. Getting out Everything. of your comfort zone is, just, it's like so important. Yeah. I've been doing, so recently, uh, there, were t there are two things that I've started to do that I'm really proud of. So one is, you know, obviously during the quarantine sort of thing, it's been hard to get to the gym. And so I bought a, uh, a jump rope. Mm. And I've been doing that, which I told you about. Great rope, great, great weight. It's a great, yeah. It's an amazing way to uh, to work out. Yeah. It's a super efficient way to like torch calories. You know, um, it's amazing for the brain. Uh, it's great. You know, it's just like for coordination for everything. And then the second thing that I started doing, I've started taking private boxing lessons. Awesome. So I found a trainer in West Hollywood. His name is Minju. Shout out to Minju. Fight Club, I think, is his, his uh, Instagram. Yeah, he's uh, this Japanese kid, and he's um, he's super, just great. He's a great trainer. Do, you know, doesn't cost me an arm and a leg, but he's super skilled. And uh, it's the first time in my life I've ever been, because I'm not, I'm not an athlete. I've always been really interested in fitness. I've always been like a weight lifter, I guess. I've always been interested in bodybuilding and stuff like that. But uh, it's the first first time in my life where I've ever had to kind of coordinate. The, what the upper body is doing with the lower body, yeah. you know, which is what you have to do when you play sports, which I've never done. Yep. And so it's been a really amazing um, thing to, to try to learn. And I was like the first lesson, I was like really bad. But by the second lesson, I was already getting better. I'm like 10 lessons in now at this point, And I feel like I, you know, like I'm, I'm getting good. I mean, I'm still mm. like still totally learning and still not, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not like my, my intent is not to, you know, become a boxer, but it's just an amazing workout. It's an, you know, again, it's amazing for the brain. It's amazing, amazing coordination. It's amazing for those dynamic full body movements. And it's just a great like confidence booster. I think it was, we, we talked about this before. I think it was like the Albert Einstein college. They did some study 
or research looking, you would know this better than I would, but they did research of uh, various different practices for, uh, again, um, cognitive function. And it was had like, you know, Scrabble and, you know, spelling bees, or you know, they had, you know, dance and they had martial arts and they had uh, walking and, you know, all the crossword puzzling, all these different things. Uh, and what they found in that, if I remember correctly, was was that dance was the most effective, mm-hmm. actually um, staving off cognitive decline uh, because of all of that, those developmental patterns that you're forcing your body to go through. You know, so your your brain isn't, as you already know, isn't this organ that's just floating around inside of a vacuum inside of your head. Like your brain is your your skin and it's your you know your 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 olfactory senses and your visual senses and your audio like all like like you're this sensory organism. <laughs> yeah. you know, like that is your brain. You know, so if you want to work on your cognitive function, get a foot massage, you know, or learn some salsa or you know, get a a uh, a dry Scraper. What are those called? Dry brush. Get a dry brush, you know, and rub your back with a dry brush. You know, your skin, from a, a embryological perspective, uh, it comes from the same layer, the ectoderm. There's there's three different layers. Uh, it comes from the same layer as your central nervous system. Wow. So your skin and your brain and your spine <laughs> evolve from the same freaking layer you know and so it's like it's like so if you want to work on your on your brain like literally like go get a massage and that's one of the reasons that uh after you once again coming back to as you would imagine come back to sex um (laughs) after you get laid the next day you're like you know you can kind of tell if someone's been like off for a while and they come in they're all smiling they're all (laughs) lit up like whoa like what's what happened max (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I just feel good. You know, it's like, oh, you got like a brain massage, but it involved your perineum and your back, of your kneecaps and your elbows and you know whatever. You know, and so as you're going through that, and also with with you know stimulating your ner- your nervous system, like the rectum and the tongue and the throat and all these places, all those are tied into that vagus nerve. You know, so if you want to, we kind of isolate these things like, cool, I'm going to get some type of electrical machine to like stimulate my, my vagal tone. You're know, like, dude, you could just go, you know, dance and sing and, you know, maybe go roll around with somebody in some bushes or whatever. And like yeah. that will stimulate your freaking vagal tone. Oh my God. You know, not to mention all of the other, you know, the, the, the entourage effect in, in nutrition where you're eating, you know, the entourage effect. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So the entourage effect, it's like. When you eat the whole apple, the, the all of the constituents of that apple kind of work together. Yeah, you know. So when you isolate and you're like biohacking quotations, your vagal vagal tonicity, you know, or whatever the heck it is that you're doing, oftentimes you're missing out on that entourage effect of doing the things that your ancestors have been doing for millions of years, and now you isolate that one specific supplement form of the movement. But when you take the whole thing in, your body's like, oh right. Yeah. Cool. We're all together in a tribal community situation and we're singing and we're drumming and, you know, now we're whatever it is that we're, you know, all the, all the things that just people do, you know, you don't, when you, when you isolate them out, um, it's, you know, it's still something, uh, but it's, you know, your body, I think doesn't really perceive it the same way as you, you eat the whole metaphoric apple. Yeah. I mean, that's why I feel like these studies on, you know, they're, they'll, they will occasionally isolate these like extracts, you know, from, from whole food sources and they'll try to bottle, you know, bottle the magic of the whole food into a pill or a supplement. Oh. And, you know, I think that often what they find is that the, you don't get near, you don't get a fraction of the benefit of that, that isolated extract. Hmm. Um, as compared to when you eat the whole food. And that's because the whole food often has all these other compounds in them that work in tandem, mm. you know, synergistically with the extract or well, whatever that think is. Think of, you know, back to, back to Vivian Lee, you know, when she's out. And Have you recently seen the movie? Is that why it's like No, fresh just because I, I researched it this morning because I was excited about it. Oh, interesting. I was so enamored by that. When, when uh, girl Pema mentioned, I was like, I was just, I thought that was so cool because wow. it's uh, mainly, I'll become especially attached to things if I hear about them after, uh, the last book was published and I'm like, 
that should have been in the book. Yeah. I'm you saying. probably get that quite a bit, right? Yeah, I You're take like, notes. Oh, that quote. That was, uh, oh. I have a I have a running Google document of all the things that I want to talk about in my next book. That's great. Yeah. Okay. I always like, I always make notes and things like that. Whether or not there is a next book coming, I'm always like, that's something that I want more people to know about. How do you determine whether you do a next book? Not whether you do, but like when, when is a book a relevant thing? Because I think there's, there's, there's different forms of book. There's like the branding book. We're like, okay, I'm going to do a book because then I have a reason to do all these podcasts and mm -hmm. media and it's going to be this boost thing and I'll make more money from it. And then there's the other one where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I have this child that needs to be birthed out of my body. Like yeah. It feels like it's growing. Um, I prefer to be on the side of like, it, it feels like this needs to be birthed out of me. That's the only, those are the only kinds of books that I've written. So I don't, I don't know what it's like to write a branding. Like, do you have you know, any pressure of feeling the next one? Or do you feel like the next one's already, is it already in, in germination? Um, I mean, I kind of feel like what the next one, I kind of have a, a an idea of what the next one might be. Um, tell us about it. Oh man, that's for a, <laughs> that's a secret. Um, but yeah, I've been, I've been sort of gestating on, on what the next book might, uh, might look like. And mm. it's something that, I mean, I guess the, a hint would be, it's something that people have, you know, followers have been asking me for, for, for a while. Huh. Um, yeah. but, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, you're all cryptic about it. I just think, I'm I just engaged. think, I just think that like pulling me in, we were talking about like the bestseller thing. Yeah. Sorry to skirt the, uh, the issue of the next book and change the subject, but it's like <laughs> <laughs> when we're, when we're talking about the bestseller thing, it's like w one of the things that I felt, the reason why it was so spiritually validating for me was the fact that I really wrote the book because I felt like it, you know, something like it hadn't existed, you know, didn't yet exist. It needed to be written and I was the right person to write it. And it was not about, it wasn't about like birthing a business for me or anything like that. You know, it wasn't about promoting a business that I already had. Like when I wrote the book, I'll tell you my, I had like no income the year that I wrote Genius Foods. Hmm. I was like living off of a fraction of the advance that I got. Um, but the rest I invested in like, you know, making the website for the book or, you know, like a little bit of like publicity help. But, uh, it was not in any way to, I mean, that, that, I think that's one of the, that is the reason why Genius Foods has resonated around the world is that it's not selling anything other than, you know, really useful, uh, I mean, and crucial information. Mm. Um, you know, it's, it's not like selling a, there's no like 30 day course, you know, to go deeper you know, into the concepts in the book. So, so what if a, a person that feels, I'd imagine a lot of people would resonate with this, of like not feeling like they have some big idea hmm. to germinate in the first place or like, I just don't, I don't know what, like what, like I just feel scattered. Yeah. You know, like how do I get that, that, that big, how do I impregnate myself with something to be impassioned by? Hmm. I like the way you put that. Um, I think that because I've certainly felt that way. I mean, I felt that way for years before I knew what my what my path was, um, and I knew with crystalline certainty what my path was when my mom got sick and I saw just the you know and I experienced the the devastation that I did and the the lack of resources available that were out there for people like me. You know, the lack of um, insight and. Uh, you know, like resources. I mean, the, before, when I, when I first got started, I mean, I think that like one of the places, the first places that I went to was like the Alzheimer's Association or something like that. And those are like these huge gargantuan, you know, it's like and nothing against the Alzheimer's Association, but um, essentially, I, you know, so, so before that, yeah, there was a period where I didn't know what my path was. And, you know, it was sort of a, I was having a bit of an existential, you know, there was a point where I was feeling very existential. Should I go back to school? You know, what, you know, what was out there for me? And I think that ultimately what you have to do is you have to trust in your talents and your abilities and you have to trust the timing of the universe and you can't force it. You know, you can't force it. Unfortunately, I mean, what, what, what helped me to realize what my mission and purpose was, was something that was very tragic, but, um, you know, I think, I think it's something that you just have to, the, the best thing that you can do in those circumstances is, is to just make sure that the surrounding condi conditions in your life are fertile so that you're open to the insight or the revelation or whatever it is once it finally is able to make its way over to you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I wonder what you, I was, I've been thinking of this today as well, and running back to the same thing we we're talking about before, like 
the difference or separation or lack thereof between your your parents and grandparents, et cetera. It feels like uh, the death of a parent essentially is um, it's almost just like you're you're foregoing a, a piece of yourself. It's like a natural part of the evolution, but it's like from that perspective of I am my mom, I am my dad, I am you know all of that. Uh, I think it's almost a beautiful thing in a way, like a like a snake shedding its skin. Hmm. You know, could you imagine if a snake had this relationship with it, its skin where it's like, I'll never let go. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. is that a is that an offensive analogy for for to relate death of of a parent as being um you know that's it's just I'm just a continuation of them. Yeah. Like I am them. And them going back into the ground and recirculating into something beautiful. They become a tree and a flower and maybe a reincarnated something depending upon your belief system. Yeah. Um but we've we talked about this before, but I almost think that I wonder if we've we've kind of got a a rough shake in Western culture with our perception of transitioning out of the body, you know, so it, it could be, it could be a lot of things based off of our, our story of perception of it. You know, it could be, Oh, they're, if a, you know, in India, if a person dies early, if they get, you know, hit by a bus on a scooter or something like that, it's like, Oh, he like graduated this corporeal form. Like, mm. wow, like cool. Like he made it. He didn't need to go through all these reps and do his taxes and <laughs> shave his armpits or whatever he's doing. You know, he's just like, he, he's out of here. He graduated. So if we had that perception of what it was to transition out of, out of this, um, I feel like it just as easily could be like something celebratory. Um, but I, th- I feel like death, I'm getting this from, from uh, Ram Dass, who I'm, I got kind of like a man crush on. Um, rest in peace, Ram Dass. Um, but uh, he's, he said that, that death in Western culture is kind of in, in the closet still. Hmm. You know, it's like it's, it's this weird subject where if you go to a lot of Latin American countries or maybe like Muslim countries or India or any of these, these, these places where uh, it's much more common for elderly and parents and all that stuff to like, and, and kids to all live in the same place. You know, and so as a child, you're exposed to death. Whereas in Western culture, it's kind of this, this weird, almost like for me, it almost feels like this, like taboo. We don't want to think about it. Don't want to talk about it, which eventually may lead to some type of like friction with the relationship. Yeah. There's an amazing Ram Dass quote. It's uh, maybe you, you know, it, Verbatim, I, I mean, I can only paraphrase, but it's something like at the end of the day, we're all just walking each other home. Totally. Is that the is that the line? That's is exactly that Ram Dass? Yeah, I think that's 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 Rami. Oh, dude, I love it. <laughs> I mean, it it does provide some comfort, you know. I mean, certainly, like it doesn't it doesn't take away the visceral feeling of losing somebody and feeling like those molecular bonds, you know, the strongest bonds that we that we have within us, are just being like torn apart. Did we ever lose them? Is it possible to lose somebody? I mean, or do we just potentially transition away from a, you know, a story of a, of a person, but like the, you can't create or destroy matter. You know, you can only kind of, kind of shift it around. Yeah. It's like, is it possible to, I mean, I don't, I don't, well, I can, I can agree with that. If I like step to the side and I look at the event of losing my mom Mm -hmm. from like a different light, you know, but that's not like that vantage point is not like where I live, you know, where I live is like, you know, I think often about how much I miss my mom and, you know, that it was just so sad what happened to her and so unfortunate and such poor luck and, you know, like just all the conditions, you know, I I start to think about what I could have, is there anything else that I could have done? But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I want to think about it as just being this, you know, like her energy has somehow, you know, just suffused the universe. Slash you. Or me. You I mean, are your mom. Well, man. I feel that. You didn't lose your mom. No, I, f- I feel you that. You are, like, she's here. I'm talking to her. I feel that, but I don't feel that. I feel it and I don't. You know, like, I yes, I agree, but I also, like, you know, I think it's it's also normal, like, or not normal, but I think it's also healthy to kind of, like also be able to to hold both of those ideas in your head at the same time that yes she's me and i'm carrying forth her torch but then but then also that i just wish things were different Mm. or you know that i wish things had been different how could they have been different i don't know (laughs) 
Oh man, it was just <laughs> like I, I can't believe that she's not here. I can't believe that you know that these there are these new cha- like that there's all these different chapters of my life that have you know like been written since her and will be written, you know, be and will be written in the future, and that I can't tell her about them and see the the smile on her face, you know. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's, I was in New York recently. The last time I was able to, well, not recently, you know, pre COVID the last time I traveled, I went to New York and, uh, I was doing press for the new book. And I just remember being so upset because, you know, New York is where I'm from. My mom lived in New York her whole life. I was, I was just so upset that my mom couldn't like see the, the new book and, and, you know, that I couldn't see the joy in her face that I was like doing all this press and, you know, putting on the TV for her so that she could watch me on TV, which she was, you know, she was always so proud of me whenever I was on TV. And I remember I saw, I was walking one day, it was just after I had like taped the Rachel Ray show. So I was on this, like this high cause yep. I, did, I did really well. And I was walking on the street and this really old decrepit woman, possibly homeless walked by me and she was carrying a black plastic garbage bag behind her, dragging it on the street. And she looked so frail and so decrepit. And she instantly, even though we were walking the opposite direction, she, she instantly reminded me of my, of my mom, mm-hmm. you know, in those moments, you know, somebody just so, so helpless and beaten down and frail by what I don't, I knew nothing about this woman's circumstances, but I walked by and I was like, oh man, I have to, I've got to go t- do something. I mean, she, she moved me, you know, in that moment. And so I went, I turned around, I walked I walked for maybe 20 more seconds. And I was like, man, you got you to turn around. I turned around. I asked her if I could help her bring the, bring her bag. You know, she was dragging it like on the floor. It was like on the, on the sidewalk in New York city. And I was like, I asked her if I could help her bring it somewhere. And I knew, you know, in the moment I was like, oh, well, you know, what am I doing? Who knows where she needs to be with this thing? But she said, no, 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 thank you. It seemed like she was like, kind of like, it seemed like she was homeless. I looked at her shoes. She was wearing like flip flops or something like, you know, I don't, they, they, they didn't even match. And then I was like, all right, well, I'm going to offer her some money. So I offered her whatever I had in my wallet. I think it was like $5. And, uh, and she couldn't, she couldn't take it. Like she said something like, we're not allowed to take money on the sidewalk, which made me think maybe she's like homeless and she can get arrested or something if she takes money, you know, in that neighborhood. And it's like, all right, well, let's step into the street and I'll give you the $5. And she wouldn't take it. She said she couldn't take five dollars, but she could take like a dollar. And so I gave her a dollar. Strange. Yeah, it's a super. It's a, it was super strange, but it it really upset me. And I went to eat lunch after that, and I started bawling, like cr- just crying my eyes out. And the whole rest of the trip was colored with that that experience. And then just before flying back to LA, I went to my mom's grave in Queens. And I just had like a complete meltdown. Like I was there for an hour and I've, n- I've never cried so much in my life. And I felt like it was the, f- it was the first time since her passing that I really got to say goodbye, like in that way, hmm. you know? Oh, good. And it was, uh, isn't that interesting? Go on. Sorry. I don't know. I mean, it was just, it felt like an, like an emotional sort of, I don't, you know, it fe- I mean, it felt cathartic. I mean, it's not that that, that, that that wasn't the last time that I thought of my mom or have wept, you know, in thinking about my mom. But mm. It's interesting how we can we create these, if we find um, some type of, um, if we see someone reminds us of someone close to us, or if, you know, you're like an old wealthy guy and you meet some young person, it's like, you remind me of me when I was your age. Mm. All of a sudden you can kind of paint them into this, this totally different perception where you start to really love them and care about them. And, you know, it's, 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 it's really interesting how plastic that is our perception of each other and how we could paint somebody else into this enemy position or paint mm. somebody else into, you know, I was learning about the uh, world war two. There's this freaking amazing documentary on Netflix that I think I've already, I know that I've already told you about called world war two in color. Hmm. So good. You've been watching a lot of world war two. Loving it. Documentary. So excited about it. I am endlessly fascinated by Hitler like the fact that that can exist like how do you go from being this sweet little fella that loves baseball and painting and architecture and opera and stuff 
Uh, I don't know if he loved baseball. Probably didn't love baseball. Actually. I just threw that part in there. But he did like architecture. Went to operas a lot. Homeless for a while. Um, had a hypo hypospadius, wow. which is uh, <laughs> wow. Why don't, why don't you share share what that is for our, for our listeners? Hypospadius is when your urethra goes hypo is is down. Hmm. Spadius means something, probably in relation to urethra, and it. Goes shoots down, points down, points down. Wow! And he had uh, undescended testicle, hmm. all sorts of interesting stuff. One undescended or both? I don't know. Wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> this is this is interesting. <laughs> Freaking interesting. Um, and so to go from that to go from that point of being this little fella who's really once again back to sexuality. He's really weird around sexuality. Um, he wasn't, which I think is another big thing. In part, why I'm enamored by sexuality is I think because it's another one of those things that's like in the closet. Death is in the closet. I think sexuality as a whole is one of those things that's like, oh, God, like we just, if that happens and, and there's a, a child around and a, a tit comes out or something like that, it's like, oh, yeah. You're like, what? Like, who, you know, that's like, you, that's your life force. Like, that's where you come from. <laughs> right. Um, anyways, so I'm very free the nipple. Free the nipple, man. Yeah, free it up. Let it go. I agree. Love all the parts. But um, so anyways, just how a person gets to be that point with Hitler is very interesting to me, so I'm getting into it. Um, But the way that we paint different people, you know, and that's what we did as Americans with the Japanese during World War II, during the 40s. Um, you know, we painted them as being, you know, they had like these big teeth and they were like these kind of like rat animal creatures. Uh, same thing that the Nazis did with, with Jews. Mm. You know, you paint these perceptions of people, which is just a story. It's no more real or less real or anything than anything. It's literally a tale. Mm. You know, and you paint that tale and layer upon layer becomes realer and realer and realer. And then eventually that becomes your reality to the point that you're fine exterminating that rat. Hmm. You know, and then you see another person where you literally just went from just the way if you, uh, there was one time I had a rat in my, in my kitchen and it got like stuck. It's still like, I've like PTSD from it. <laughs> it got like somehow, oh, I had a little snapper thing. I apologize for people that are like vegetarian um, or just don't want to snap rats. It was a bummer. I, I, I'm actually literally yeah. like feel shocked by it. Those things are pretty brutal. It's not least. okay. It's yeah. not okay. So anyway, but it was like a big guy. And so it got snapped and then it got like concussed. Oof. People may cover their ears for this for the next like 27 <laughs> seconds. Um, so it got concussed and then it got stuck underneath like my grate thing. Uh, you know, and then in the, in the oven and then I like, I'm like, ah, like whacking it because now I don't want it to suffer, you know. But anyway, so that my perception of that rat is, oh, okay, it's just a vermin. Yeah. I can exterminate that. It's, that's in the okay pile to destroy with my hands. And then I can go to the very next moment and go feed my puppy, mm. you know, and then pet my cat and then massage my girlfriend and then shake my buddy's hand and uh, be like an upstanding citizen. Mm. But we have all of these catalog stories of each individual being and like, you know, the value of their life. And uh, what I was thinking as you were speaking was just how interesting that would be if somehow... I mean, maybe the answer is like ayahuasca or psilocybin or something like, like that, but um, or meditation or near death experiences or you know all sorts of different things, breath work. Uh, we could start to hack people's minds into a place where they perceive a wider uh, bandwidth, a wider strip of the world as being, oh, you're my mom. Oh, you remind me of me. Hmm. You know, and you start to move through the world and like every freaking person, every homeless person I see, Trump. Hitler, you know, my brother, my mom, random guy playing tennis, all of them. It's like, oh, wow, you're like, you're like me. You're like my brother. You're like my dad. You're like my mom. Hmm. You know, but the, the journey to hacking that story is like, it's very interesting. Yeah. I, f- I feel like that's where we're seeing all this progress with uh, psilocybin, MDMA, mm-hmm. and the treatment of PTSD. Um, probably, be, you know, in no small part because it can, I feel like, encourage those feelings of oneness. Totally. You know, which they've talked about at, uh, Michael Pollan's written about it at Imperial College in London. They're talking about it. Yeah. Um, well, the root of everything is oneness. Yeah. All the new age, hippie, annoying, patch pant, dready kind of stuff that you're like, okay, please shut up. Like, 
the root of most of that stuff, like One Love, Bob Marley, it's legit. Yeah. You know, if you wind it back enough, like, uh, oh, yeah, Gaia. <laughs> like, that makes a ton of sense. I also think it's important to also, I mean, that that's why it's so important to be, you know, uh, just, uh, you know, more conscientious with, like, how you use language, you know? Yeah. Like, it's, it's the reason why calling things, you know, I mean, as a kid, people, we used to call things gay, you know, if we didn't, like, mm -hmm. you know, if we thought that they were lame, which is so screwed up, you know, because it paints gay people as being, you know, it paints people who identify with that word as being somehow inferior, you know, the same thing with the word retarded. My mom was always, uh, I mean, my, there were so many amazing things that my mom, she was, she was such a beautiful spirit, but she, you know, one of the things she would never like when the word pig was thrown around, you know, like, oh, that person's such a pig, because it actually paints the animals mm. as being, you know, less than or something. My mom was a big animal animal advocate. You know, she loved animals. So she was like, "Why why are we going to call something a pig if it's not if it has some traits that aren't desirable?" You know, don't yeah. use don't use that language. Hmm. Um, but I think it's more like words, in my opinion, do not have as much power as what we grant them, and they do at the same time. The power comes from the in, the intention, the intonation, like what you're putting into hmm. the word. You know, so if you're hanging out with some people and they're like, like I grew up s s flinging gay around all the time, you know, and like my intention was never to put down or belittle people that are, you know, attracted to the same sex. Um, you know, so the, I, I think the in intention is vastly different, you know, so there, there are some words like the F word, F-A-G, I don't like saying that one because that one's like an extra charge one, um, yeah. but that one's like uh you know, the, the meaning of that is a bundle of sticks. Like a faggot is a bundle of sticks meant for burning. Hmm. So like that, like the depths of the, the, the origin story of that word is just like, it's pretty polluted all the way up. Yeah. You know, whereas a word like gay, the origin of that is like, oh, to be, to be merry, hmm. to be happy, to be happy. You know, so I think that like the, the intention, if you say like when something's like, oh, that's kind of gay. You know, it's like in my perception growing up in Pennsylvania and like the East Coast and all that stuff and having that word like drilled into me, my sense of that had nothing at all to do with human beings. Yeah. It was literally it's just like, oh, it's like it's a little fruity. Well, th and, and th <laughs> you know, it's, like, yeah. it's, little, it's all right. I got nothing wrong with that. No, <laughs> things, can, things can be gay. <laughs> And that doesn't, that's not a judgment call. No judgment call. Christmas is pretty gay. Pretty gay. Pretty gay. <laughs> oh, man. Did we leave my audience with anything actionable? We're not done. Over the past hour? We're wrapping this thing up. We don't have to wrap it up. We can keep going. We got to talk about Vivian Ann. Vi who's that? Uh, the uh, Gone with the Wind Girl. Oh, the Gone with the Wind Girl. Yeah. Oh, you said it in a way that I feel like it was. Vivian Ann, yeah. Yeah. We talked about her. <laughs> you were just like, we've got to talk about Vivienne as if we hadn't already talked about her. We can talk, what, what else is there to say? Well, there's different layers to it. So there's, oh. so we'll, so <laughs> we'll, uh, we can wrap this thing up. But the, uh, coming back to that point, because there was more things that I was excited about saying with that, um, the entourage effect of the experience of uh, the mother and the parents and all that stuff going outside uh, and doing the fitness and doing, you know, being out there. There's a lot of other different interesting layers to that experience of doing the fitness, doing the walk, and being outside, um, such as, you know, as you're outside, all stuff that you've already talked about, like probably ad nauseum at this point, you know, you're breathing in the fight insides and all the different chemicals that boost your immune system and do all the stuff that like make you feel good, mm. you know, increasing your dopamine and all that stuff, just like by being outside or even a, a, uh, a patient in the hospital, if they have access to a window, I know you've heard this one as well, it decreases the necessity of pain medications. So if you're laying down and the other thing that decreases the necessity of pain medication is choice. So if you have the choice of how much you're going to use, then typically you'll end up using less hmm. because your story um, is that I am empowered. Hmm. You know, so if you, with your eyes, you can look out, it feeds once again back into that story of like, I'm not a sick, imprisoned patient. You know, my, the, what I'm consuming with my eyes is literally it's, it's sending me this information of like, oh, wow, like I'm free. Hmm. 
You know, and so if we can start to to uh, once again hack those stories, I'm kind of like conflating the idea of the you know our perception of each other and the and the Vivian Ann stuff. Um, but we're just we're always being tuned by our environment. Yeah, you know, and that gets back into the epigenetic stuff. You know, so our literal physical environment, you know, it it affects us. Whether it's it's light exposure, whether it's breathing the chemicals from the plants and whatnot. Um, whether it's being around certain people that are maybe making certain facial expressions that cause us to feel a certain way because we're continually attuning to each other's facial expressions. So when you like walk into a room and the room makes you feel a way, hmm. you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. And you go in, you're like, like what the vibe, <laughs> like you go into certain rooms and like you immediately have this sensation of like, okay, I feel a way. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's like, I feel in my stomach. I feel like, I, feel, I don't think I should be here. Hmm. You know, or like, ah, oh, it feels welcoming. Like, ah, oh, this room like pulled me in. You know, and so when you go into that room, there's all sorts of, you know, like Rupert Sheldrake is an interesting resource if people want to go kind of more off the deep end hmm. of, of what the hell is going on with that. It's called Morphic Resonance. Morphic Resonance? Morphic Resonance, hmm. yeah. Rupert Sheldrake, he's like one of the main expert guys. I've been going back and forth with him via email to have him on my podcast, actually. Cool. Um, you know who else I'm having on next week is uh, Bruce Lipton, biology of belief guy. Oh, wow. Do you know who he is? Uh, no. What? Wait, maybe. Biology, I believe that was like the first book that I read. I'm thinking James Lipton, Inside the Actor's <laughs> Studio. <laughs> no, I don't know. Bruce <laughs> Lipton? Bruce Lipton? Yeah. Bruce Lipton? No. Bruce Lipton, you're listening. You changed my life. Seriously? Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah his, his book, Biology of Belief. Highly recommend it. Biology I'm listening to the audio book right now because huh. I've got an interview with him coming up in like on the 14th. Dope. In Santa Cruz. Wow. I'll uh, check him out. He's great, yeah. Hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a big chunk of the whole biology of belief essentially is that our our perception of the world around us it literally has a you know a, a mechanical response to the way that our our cells produce themselves, you know. And so your DNA, you know, a la like the the human genome project thing where they're going through and sequencing all the all the genes and they figure because there's you know hundreds of thousands of proteins there must be so many genes you're like oh my god there's 25,000 genes or something like that you know it's like oh, okay so each of these genes apparently what I read in, in, in Bruce's book recently um, each of those genes has the potential to produce uh, upwards of, of 2,000 different proteins Wow based off of you know the the, the the your the story of the way that you perceive that world. So if you can move through the world in such a way that you perceive things from that loving lens, you know where you you walk in, you see like oh wow, like man, I like I see myself in you. You know, not in a homoerotic way. Back to that stuff, uh, but I see like wow, like, like you like remind me of of myself when I was your age or whatever. Or like oh, you remind me of this person that, and you have that open loving perception of each other. It, it literally, at a, a cellular level, changes the way that you produce yourself. Hmm. So all of a sudden, you start having this, you know, release, r- release of, you know, oxytocins and, you know, the, the, the whole cocktail of neurochemistry starts fluctuating and the hormones surging through your blood just based off of that instance of something transitioning your perceived story of the world. Pretty amazing. Fucking crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty. So how do we hack that stuff? That's my question. I think we just need to be better curators of what we allow to, you know, what of our environment, ultimately. Mm-hmm. And probably seeking out, because it does feel like we're wrapping up, um, the thing we kind of talked about in the beginning was was seeking out things that are challenging to love. You know, so if you're only putting yourself in the, the park of the things that I already acknowledge as being like a part of me, hmm. and you're like, okay, cool. Like elementary school, yeah, you've got it. That that puppy, easy to love, fine. You know, maybe get a pet rat. Hmm. <laughs> you know, be able to like see like, oh wow, well, like I can see my puppy in that rat. Yeah, you know, or find some. I don't know. You know how whatever. does that how does that apply to the relationships that we have with people? Should we be in relationships with people that are tough to love? Yeah, I think so. Huh. But it doesn't mean you need to like bring the rat home. 
you know, you can be at the grocery store and find that person that is, you know, whatever. They're shaking their fists and yelling at somebody and angry, and you can see their blood's pumping and their little heart's pumping, and they're like, ah, they're like full stress response. Hmm. You know, and the likely direction would be like, wow, that's a crazy bitch. You know, or, you know, guy or girl like that, like, whoa. Um, that would be the easy thing, write that person off, you know, and be like, wash my hands of it, cool, I'm gonna go back to my pen that I'm comfortable with. These are the people that are easy to love. My group of 10 people that I think are cool. Hmm. I'll just stay right there. You know, but in that moment, you went out and you had, you know, like a master class of being able to, uh, almost like it was like a like an MMA fight. Like, ooh, like, oh man, that was like a, like a master level contender. You know, where it's like, how can I find some, how can I find the, the, the root of something more loving in that person that seems like a, you know, like a B-I-T-C-H. Hmm. I don't know why I spelled that. We can say bitch on here. Yeah, totally. Like female dog. It's all about my, my, my uh, intention. I like it. Um, wise words. Oh, whatever. Love having you here. <laughs> <laughs> this has been, this has been really fun. Um, I appreciate it, man. And also, the, today's the day after your birthday. Woo! So happy birthday again. Double happy birthday. Um, although by the time this airs, your birthday won't will be. have passed by won't be anymore sometime. Um, but appreciate you, appreciate you. Um, where can listeners find you on social media, and where can they pick up your book? Well, the book, you know, the Align Method, Amazon. That's where people buy books. Yeah, I say go to the store. But I, don't, I don't even bookstores exist anymore. Uh, I don't know. They're oh, hanging man. on. Are They're, they? Hanging well, on? some, a few. Holy crap! It's it's hard though. It's a Tough. I mean, that, tough may, time to be that maybe is a part of the transitions. It's like a death. Hmm. Like we're experiencing. I know we need to. Do you have like a time that you've like hard out? I'm going to keep on talking about shit. And you're like, Aaron, I really need to go. Uh, I don't have hard out. All right. But All right, hold on. This is the last thing. Okay. Okay. Um, Producer Max is probably bummed as well. He's like, son of I was almost, Producer I, Max. I was almost out of here. <laughs> I was walking out the door. Um, do you know the uh, Kubler Ross stages of grief? I have the book downstairs. Okay. Um, I forget them, but like oh. I, I don't know them off the top well, of my head. Why? Um, I I've just found an interesting overlay of those stages of grief in the way that culture has been responding to like everything. Hmm. You know, so I don't, I don't think I'm going to remember them right now and either actually. So there's five. The first one is denial. I know, is that that's correct? one of them. I think the first one's denial. I think you, you hear it and you're just like, oh, like you're numb. Mm. You're like, oh, okay, nothing happened. It's fine. Nothing really happened. Um, and then I think that turns into anger. You say, oh, like, fuck, why did that? Why do they go? Why? Why me? Um, and then it goes into. I might be mixing these guys up, but it goes into like depression, and then it goes into these various different stages. It eventually, comes into acceptance, and that's when you like move on. And I, th- I feel as though culturally. It's an interesting if you if you take the thirty thousand foot view of what's happening in the world and in, in, in almost anything, but especially with like the, the global crises, um, you can kind of see these different stages of the way that humanity, as like a single organism, is responding to everything. You know, and it, it was a fascinating thing to to watch the the riots and all that stuff because it seemed to me like uh, we're going through some type of loss. You know, and a, and a very obvious loss would be like, okay, we will lost George Floyd. You know, we lost these like obvious human beings. You know, but then perhaps another loss could be an old way of life. You know, so we're we're like, oh man, there was a time where do you remember bookstores? Hmm. It's like, yeah, no, they can't cut it anymore. Do you remember gyms? No, that's not really a good model when you got to go in, it's closed half the day, and you got to wear little rubber latex gloves and yeah. like a face mask while you're on a treadmill. It's like, whoa. So now it's like, yeah, yeah, the internet. So it's almost, it feels to me almost like, and maybe things will all go back to the way that they were in a year or whatever, I don't know. But it feels to me almost as though there is, there would be some type of natural grieving process that would manifest as a product of us transitioning out of uh, like a previous cultural belief in a way. It's so hard to let go. Yeah. of those things <laughs> and just to let go of you know to let go of any just to let go you gotta let go man you gotta oh, let go man. to let in that's why I always say you know it's important to support bookstores you know if you if you have the option to go out and you know buy Aaron's book you know do it get it from your local bookstore cause they're I mean yeah I mean you're right and you'll if you do get it you'll see me as a 
I like that precocious adolescent roidal female on the cover. <laughs> Damn, dude. <laughs> yeah, it is a great photo of you. I had I don't remember the I last time. I look like I'm 13. You do, yeah. <laughs> but it helps sell the book, I'm sure. The ladies want to get their hands on that. The ladies and the fellas. I gotta have you back on my podcast. The fellas want to be with you. The, be, the fellas want to be you. The ladies want to be with you. And some fellas want to be with you too. Tupac uh, has a line like that, but it's too vulgar for the genius life. Does Tup- he? You know the Tupac line? I love Tupac. I don't know the line. Dude, he was a smart fella. He was a savage, yeah. I went through moments of uh, watching a, a, like a whole slew of his interviews. He seemed kind of uh, flamboyant hmm. as a kid. Interesting. Look, I'll show you. I'll show you an interview with him specifically. Of where he was, um, I think he was like seventeen or something like that. For some reason, he must have been good at rapping at that point or something. I don't. I don't actually know why he was being interviewed. I don't know what point he like came up or whatever. Um, but it was like high school or something. And he had very. He was like um, very like empathetic and very like nurturing and very like feminine and his gesticulations with his hands and everything. It was like it was like. I kind of think that Tupac might have been bisexual. Interesting. Never heard that. I t- probably total bullshit. But I wonder if perhaps if that story was something. Um, I mean, I think a lot of men are bisexual. They just don't. Again, the cultural narrative is that that's not okay. Yeah. You, know, you grow up calling each other fags and gay and all that stuff. You're like, okay, like, mm-mm, like mm-hmm. not here. Especially as Latin America, it's even worse. Um, but then you go into like Roman times, and it was. Do we already talk about this? No. I think maybe. Uh, Roman times, it was, it was much more common yeah. for, you know, it was like a, for a young boy, apparently, to uh, sleep with an old dude, that would be like, like, a, like a warrior, that would be like gathering warrior energy from the guy. Yeah. And that was like a very common thing. Yeah. Or like a mentor, a teacher. Yeah. Like the philosophers like the, used to do that. They used to sleep with their their pupils. Right. And they felt that that sexually, you know, that that like intercourse was a way to to basically pass your knowledge onto or into yeah. your your student. There's a term for that. I don't remember what it is. We mm. need we need we need Mr. Producer Max to give us the term. It's called I'm not going to remember what it's called, but we can look it up. There there's a term for um, when a female sleeps with a male and the male ejaculates into the female, a part of their DNA... Gets, yeah, it stays. It stays. Hmm. And so, and this is a very common belief in various cultures all around the world still today, that the child that is bared from that woman isn't just the, the child of, like, the last, you know, the guy that the, the sperm actually made the race to the egg and all that stuff. It's actually the the aggregate of all of the men that she's, she's been with. Wow. And... The potential reality, I think they did this with like mosquitoes or something like that. I don't think they've proven it with humans, but the potential is that that is actually true. And so when you are sleeping with a person, it's actually a, a, a pretty big deal. You know, and so a, a kind of rule that I have um, now, I'm much better at, at, at standing by it than I have been in the past. Um, but unless I want to be that person, be a part of that person, and have that person be a part of me, um, then I'm like, I don't think I want to really wow. do that. Wow. <laughs> Which is why alcohol is so interesting. All of a sudden, alcohol comes into the equation, and that like that bar goes... Doo, 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 doo. Yeah, we were talking about this last night. Yeah, I'm I, not down with that. Yeah, if, it, I, if we're not sober, or if we're just not on alcohol, a girl on alcohol for me is like a, it's a deal breaker. Yeah, I found it very difficult to, because I don't, I mean, I drink sometimes. I'm not dogmatic about it. You know, I'll drink red wine. I'll, yeah, I'm a, I like sake, you know, good sake, whatever. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I used to drink like on dates exclusively, and I found that it made it a lot easier to be into somebody that you weren't really all that into. Yeah. And so now I think it's a much it's much better to try to assess whether or not you're into a person yeah. through sober eyes. Well think if your world you've kind of been almost like artificially in present imprisoned. There's a, a term uh, learned helplessness. Do you know this term? Mm-hmm. Learned helplessness is they, they've done studies with like dogs and such where they would put them on do you know about these things? They'd like shock the dog's little feet. And then they would, so they'd, they'd give the dogs the option, one group of dogs, 
know, they shock their feet, they're all bummed out, they're, they're like, oh, like, this sucks. Uh, and then they give one group of dogs the option to be like, okay, press this button, and th- the buzzer goes off, you don't get shocked anymore. And those dogs like, oh, 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 oh. they press the button, oh, oh, cool, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. You know, and then the other ones, they uh, keep shocking, they don't give them a potential to, to turn it off, and then they go to a point where eventually they kind of collapse and they're just like, oh, okay, I'll just sit into the shock. And then when they're presented the option to unshock themselves, they're over it. You know, and so I think that they're, they're over it in the sense that they don't do it. They're like, wow. oh, I'm just, oh, wow. fuck, they just, just, I'm just in it. They just grin and bear it. <sighs> wow. You know, and so the, uh, I think a lot of people in, in like mediocre, in quotations, Western world, they've kind of almost like learned helplessness themselves into a position where, um, and I, I feel like I've experienced this before, like even in my own life, just like, just things just feel gray, you know, just mundane, you know? And I think that when you're in that, that place, um, I think alcohol can be a really helpful way to all of a sudden paint that situation. It's like, this is actually pretty cool. You know, and the, the bar drops, and then you can become addicted to that sensation hmm. of you dropping your, dropping the bar. your sensitivity to hmm. the environment. And that's why you, you, know, you go to some shitty dive bar and you can't hear what anybody's saying and someone just threw up on your shirt. Oh. And you're like, this is kind of cool. <laughs> she's hot. Yeah, it's not cool at all. And she's actually... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, but you drop that bar down um, and you know, it can be a helpful tool in those, in those situations. But I think it's another route is, okay, I would like to think this situation is rad without any form of inebriation. And then from there, once, once reality passes that test, then it's like, okay, now we can like titrate some whatever it is that you'd like to involve yeah. in the situation. But ideally, you're not incorporating this substance into the reality because you, the reality that you actually have created, the story that you've woven for yourself, isn't adequate. Right. And so now we're like, okay, we'll bring the substance in, lower the bar. Now all of a sudden, this is fine. Right. <laughs> Make sure it's epic first. Epic first. Yeah. Assess then do first. As you, then do as you wish. Then do it. And that's 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 exactly <laughs> how I treat alcohol these days. That's great. Yeah. I'll never drink, you know, unless I'm like consenting to the experience after I've already determined that the environment, you know, deserves that extra addition, you know, that extra punctuation. Yeah. That extra exclamation point, if Punctuate you will. Punctuate that stuff. And watch out for people that are dogmatically against drugs and alcohol and all that stuff watch out for them yeah i think so be flexible yeah they're all tools yeah well, i agree with that yeah mdma well you know psilocybin like all it's like they've been put into a, a taboo section of culture um in large part for people political agendas and financial agendas and you know, like the whole war on drugs was from my understanding of it was a la nixon wanting to uh, have a reason to imprison black people and hippies because they would be voting against him. So like, okay, like what are they doing? Like they're, they're not really like, I got to get them out of culture. Wow. How do I get them out of culture? It's like, well, they like heroin. These guys love weed. Like they're in this like psychedelic stuff. Okay, well, that's illegal. <laughs> you take that whole demographic of people out of the equation. And now you launch this massive, you know, billion, probably trillion, I don't know how much money, a lot of money war on your own people Hmm. as a means of pushing your own political agendas. And now that story gets ingrained into culture. And then you see things like Reefer Madness. Have you seen Reefer Madness? No. Oh, good. Gotta watch Reefer Madness. Netflix? Ridiculous. I don't know, YouTube probably. So Reefer Madness um, is about. It's, it's like full on just like governmental propaganda piece on the, the dangers of marijuana. Wow. You know, and so marijuana originally cannabis. Marijuana is, you know, a little bit more of a dangerous name. It's like, oh, marijuana. It's like from Mexico. And it's like yeah. these dangerous people. And they're coming here to like rape our women and steal and all this stuff. Um, you know, but cannabis, like a good chunk of our, of the United States history is based off of the crop of cannabis and hemp. You know, and so... That got transitioned again for political agendas, and then that story gets baked into your reality. And now we have this experience with something as as benign as and and, and supportive and helpful as something like can, cannabis, 
Um, you know, and even just you, you talk about it, you're like, can I talk about this on a podcast? And that's all just a process of rewiring, rewiring our story to be like more honest with like, okay, like what is this? This is a, this is a tool. You know, this isn't just bad, good, moralistic. Hmm. It's like, okay, this is a tool. Here's the values. Okay. Glaucoma. Okay. Uh, eating disorders. Okay. Like all of these different things, anxiety, you know, pain. Okay. That's the tool. You know, or you could live in a culture where it's just like binary, black, white, bad, good. Yeah. You do that. You put your blinders on. But jail done. You know, blinders on. Don't do that. Cool. You're good. You're in the. You're on the team. Awful. Yeah. I'd much rather the former, where we can have like a nuanced conversation. Everything is nuanced. Yeah. Everything. 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 It's so important. Especially today, I feel like we live in. I mean, if nothing else, it's an era of like black and white thinking, and you know. Is that a pun? Uh, no, not a pun. But I mean, yeah, it, it unfortunately, you know, it's that, that crazy. Yeah. But like cancel culture and, um, you know, just everybody's so inflamed. And so, uh, like everybody has such a short fuse these days. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, we should all be, we should all encourage nuance, you know, I think the shorter a fuse a person has, the more insecure they are in their own beliefs. Yeah, I, th I think so too. You know, and so it's like if you are, if you secretly, whatever, whatever the thing is, say a person like going back to talking about the gay stuff, if a person is, is in the closet about anything, hmm. you know, gay is just a, a very, you know, it's a common one. Um, that person will be more likely to defend. You know, like, oh, I'm not, oh, I don't know, I'll keep him away from me. Oh. You know, you like you see it. You're like ready to defend, but a person that's actually truly comfortable in their own skin and in their belief systems and their ideologies and just the way that like they sit in the world, they don't have a a, a big reason to to put up these vast defenses on everything. Yeah. So you can almost, I think, it's an interesting way. Again, this is kind of like a way to like find the love in people. The person that that presents with the biggest guns. And the biggest muscles sometimes, and you know that is the most is the aggressor. Oftentimes, are the person that's that's actually hurting the most. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think it's also a testament to you know meditation and what that can do for you, or at least the understanding that meditation kind of helps create a little bit of a buffer, like a, a little bit of a space between you know the stimulus and the response. Totally. I feel like today that, for so many people there's there is no space. You know, it's like literally like reactionary. It's you know, we're so reactionary. It's a problem. I was in a like a long term on and off relationship with somebody who I cared about very much, but because of trauma in her life, she was just always she was so reactive. You know, she just there was, she had no space to like think about things before like reacting in a way that was like instinctual, like a cat, you know, that's been yeah. well, you become, framed. You become like a pinball machine, but yeah. instead of the player, you're the pinball. You know, so you're just like, tung, 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 it's tung, exhausting. Tung, tung. It's gotta be exhausting. Like that's your life is just slapped to each different paddle. And you're like, Oh God, here we are again. You know? And then there's like the other perspective of being able to sit with him and be like, I am in a goddamn pinball machine. <laughs> 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 you, you come back like, all right, I'm going to start playing this thing. The pinball machine doesn't disappear, but you come out of it. Right. Yeah. And you take the controls. Mm. And you're like, this is all a big fucking game. It's all a big game. <laughs> Watch out, because that could lead to nihilistic apathy. Oh, man. Coming to you from Aaron Alexander. <laughs> oh, man. Dude, well, thank you for being here. This was so fun. To all you guys out there in podcast land, thank you for tuning in. Text me. Let me know what you thought about this episode of the show. 310-299-9401. Grab Aaron's new book, mm. The Align Method. It's a great book. And we'll get you back on uh, The Align Podcast. Sounds good. Sounds I'm good. Looking forward to these, looking, looking these forward moments. to that. Catch you guys on the next episode. Peace. Peace out.